Now this week, of course, we're continuing our sermon series in Haggai. The title is God Brought You Here, Now What? Um, in way of review, remember that Haggai takes place right after, excuse me, a few years after Israel has been released from exile. Now they were sent out there because they were sinful, they didn't listen to the Lord, and so God said, if you're not going to act like my people, you're not going to live in the land I gave to my people. And so finally, after 70 years, God fulfills his promise. He brings them back from exile, and they're supposed to get to work rebuilding the temple. Um, now, of course, we know it's not about the building, right? It's about what the building represents. And so the temple showed God's presence with his people, showed that he kept his promises, he kept his covenant, and that he also loved all people and wanted all of them to come and worship him. Israel, uh, under King Cyrus, was given the freedom and the materials they needed to go back and build the temple. But they faced a mild opposition and almost immediately stopped. Israel left the temple in ruins for 20 years and used the wood that they should have used for the temple to build themselves nice houses. This is where Haggai is. And so at this point, it's been about 20 years. God certainly would have been justified to give up on Israel, to wipe them out and start over. But God doesn't because as he told Moses and as we heard um, also in Psalm 145 this morning, the Lord is a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion and sin. And so this is amen indeed. This is the love of God. Yet we also know that God is holy. He is so perfect, he is so separate from sin that he can't tolerate sin. He can't wink at it and say, good enough. No, instead, God has to make a way for sin to be punished. And so he will not leave the guilty unpunished. He brings the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. This, by the way, is what happened to Israel. David married a bunch of wives. His son married a bunch more, and before you know it, God's temple, supposed to be filled with dedication to him, is filled with altars and, and all sorts of pagan rituals to every god but him. And so Israel is already in this place where the sin of one person has affected generations. But finally, God says he loves his people so much, he's going to discipline them, he's going to pull them out of their sin. And so through Haggai... God is calling out Israel's sin, saying, get up, go in the hill, rebuild the temple, and I will be pleased and I will be glorified. And so the people begin to rebuild the temple, and that's where we are in chapter 2. And we're going to call this first set of verses, the present discouragement. Read along with me. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and to the remnant of the people. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem to you like nothing in comparison? Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. Work, for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of armies. This is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. So the first thing we see in this passage is when God's word comes to Haggai again. It is now the 21st day of the seventh month. It's been over a month since the Lord first spoke to Haggai. But more significant this day marks exactly 440 years since Solomon's temple had been built. This was also the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, a celebration of God's faithfulness and also when they would bring in the crops. Now, of course, we know where Israel is. Solomon's temple has been destroyed for decades. Because of Israel's sin, God sent a famine. There's no crops to bring in. This is a rather hopeless place they seem to be in right now. The first temple, of course, was magnificent. It was huge. It was beautiful. It was filled with all the riches of Solomon and represented the very best of Israel's workmanship. Yet it was destroyed, of course, because Israel hadn't kept their end of the deal. In fact, when Solomon built the temple, God told him that he would be faithful to his people 
establish this temple, keep them in the land, all these things, if they are faithful to him. But of course, they weren't faithful. This beautiful temple, in fact, was very quickly filled with pagan altars and prostitutes. And they even sacrificed their children there. And now here we are in Haggai's day, 440 years since that temple was built. Not only are they reflecting on the failure that happened while the temple was up, they're thinking of the 70 years in exile in Babylon, carried far away from their homeland. They're thinking about all the crops that they can't harvest because their sin was so great the Lord wouldn't let them have anything. And so God speaks to Haggai and he asks, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Now, it's been about 70 years since that temple was up. It had been quite a while. If there were any Israelites left, they would have been very few. And it seems like they would have been very bitter because God's asking, how does it look? Doesn't it seem like nothing? It's quite a series of questions, of course. It seems like there were a very few, very old, very bitter group of Israelites who had been discouraging the people in their work to rebuild the temple. Perhaps they were saying, well, look at this temple. It's nothing like the old one. John Calvin says, it seemed to them like a shed as opposed to a temple. They might have been saying, look at these crops that we're not gathering in. They might have been saying, should we even do this work at all? It doesn't seem like God's with us. Old Testament scholar Eugene Merrill said of this passage, the pessimism of the elders apparently so affected the morale of the people that in this day of Haggai's vision, virtually everyone is despondent and in need of a word of encouragement. And so this is why God speaks. God doesn't leave his people in the dust, right? Just like in Haggai 1, they hadn't been doing anything for 20 years, but God still speaks to them. And so God speaks to them now. Solomon had adorned this temple, of course, with great riches, with the very best of Israel's workmanship. It represented everything that was good and beautiful in the world, and it was dedicated to the Lord. <clears throat> now they're building this temple with scraps, with a few people, few discouraged people. Excuse me. <clears throat> it does, of course, seem like nothing. But here's what God reminds them. Nostalgia is nothing compared to God being with you. God says, even though it doesn't seem like anything is going on here at work because I'm with you. And that's the important part. God wasn't with that old temple very long. They weren't faithful, were they? But God's going to be with this one. And so these folks needed to know this message that God is with them. And that's what mattered. Not what they could do. Not what things looked like. Not the circumstances they were in. But was God with them or not? God had brought them this far, brought them out of exile, brought them here to this moment. And so the thing they have to do now is simply to turn to the Lord and trust in him. He's brought them this far. He'll bring them the rest of the way. And so God gives his people two encouragements. Now, notice he doesn't say anything about this discouragement. The temple does look like nothing. The work is hard. The people are few. The people are discouraged. He doesn't say these problems are nothing. He tells them, even so, be strong, I am with you. And of course, it's a great reminder for us, whatever the challenges are in our path, they may be challenging. But if we work for the Lord, he is with us. And that's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference to Israel. And so it reminds us of, of another time when the Israelites should have been discouraged, when it seems like all was lost, when it looked like what they had was only a pale reflection of what came before. You remember, of course, Moses, the greatest of Israel's leaders. We read in Deuteronomy after Moses dies. There never arose another prophet like him. Well, Moses dies. He's had four books where he's the main character besides God, right? Moses dies. It's time to lead the people back into the promised land. And what are they supposed to do? Joshua is raised up. And so God tells Joshua, I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land, I swore to your fathers. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And just like God was with Joshua, and so he could work and trust that the Lord would accomplish this mission, so too is God with the people in Haggai's day rebuilding the temple. And so he gives them two motivations to continue this work. First of all, that he made a covenant with them. 
A covenant is a sacred promise. It's one of the most important words in the Bible. God made a promise, and God can't break his promises because he's perfect. And we're very good at breaking our promises, right? But God certainly isn't. And so God's reminding them, I made a promise to you based on my character. It will never go away. He says, this is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt. And what is it a new thing that God would overcome challenges for his people? It wasn't a new thing that he would be among them. It wasn't a new thing that he'd give them his word, that he would give them his spirit. This is simply factory default for God when his people listen to him. So the Lord made a covenant with them. This was the promise he made to them. God had this plan before the world was even formed. And so these discouraged exiles can trust that if God's with them and God has this task, he's going to accomplish it. He also says his spirit is present among you. Um, Now, really, the Hebrew suggests more that God is not just with his people now. He's continued to be with his people. And so a lot of translations say God's spirit remains among the people. Now, if you remember at the end of Haggai 1, the Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, roused the spirit of Joshua, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. The spirit roused the people. The spirit was still there. God hadn't changed, even if their attitudes, even if their outward circumstances had. And so God's promising to be there with them and get his work done. But there's more than that. In the next verses, we see that God also gives a future promise of glory. Look with me in verses 6 to 9. For the Lord of armies says this, Once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. The silver and gold belong to me. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of armies. I will provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Now, in verses 1 to 5, the Israelites have just been told to work, been told that his spirit is present among them, that his promises are still there, but there's more. They're working not just for this temple to look good now. They're working for something in the future. Here's what God says. He's going to shake the nations. He's going to shake the heavens and the earth. Now, what does this mean? Is God going to grab the the globe like a baby playing with a toy? Well, somewhat, actually. The idea here is that God, being so much bigger, so much greater than everything in the universe, he can shake it around like a toy. God is going to remove, destroy, take away everything in the world that shouldn't be there. Here's a New Testament idea of saying the same thing. Jesus says that God will separate the wheat from the chaff the usable part of the plant from the unusable. This metaphor showed the Israelites, and it shows us that God is in control. God is greater than any challenges and any evil powers that lie in our path, and God won't let evil run rampant forever. Instead, one day, once and for all, God will call out his sheep and destroy the wicked. And so we start to see in Haggai 2, in contrast to Haggai 1, This is a chapter that spans all over redemptive history, and we're going to see that as we work our way through the passage, as we look at these headings. God's telling these people now what he's going to be doing later. Now, in God's time, it's not that much later at all. He says, once more in a little while. Once and for all, very soon I'm going to do this. Um, This is very common in the Bible. The Lord's timing is a lot different than ours. Uh, For example, in Revelation, these things are happening soon. Well, 2,000 years later, they haven't quite happened. But one day, in our mind, is like 1,000 years to the Lord, of course. And so God has his hands on this. God hasn't forgotten about them. We also see, when God says once more he's going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land and all the nations, we're reminded that God has done this before, right? God flooded the earth. He destroyed everybody but Noah and his family because of their great horrid sin that they wouldn't turn from. God drowned uh, Pharaoh and all of Egypt's armies in the Red Sea. God destroyed the Canaanites. He toppled Assyria and Babylon. This is just God doing God's thing. But what God's telling the people of Haggai's day right now is that he's going to do this and do this once and for all. One day there will be no more Egypts. There will be no more Babylons. There will be no more Romes. There will be no more Russias. God's going to bring redemptive history to an end. 
Not only has God brought Israel this far, not only has he brought us this far, he's going to bring Israel, the true Israel, everyone in all of history who loves and trusts God even farther. And so the implicit message here is that we trust God in this interim time. When it seems so long since God made these promises about returning, when even the best of our labors, we still look up and say, it seems like nothing. We know that God's hand is over us, that he is bringing redemptive history to its end. He also says when he shakes the heavens and the earth, when he shakes the nations, that he will fill this house with glory. Now that's an encouragement, right? Looking at this building, it doesn't look very glorious. In fact, they were told by the king they couldn't make it as tall as the previous temple. And so they're thinking, there's no way this can be as good as it's supposed to be. It can't be as big. We don't have all these riches. But it's not the external looks. It's not the labors of people that make something great. It's God filling it with his glory. And so God promises he's going to do this. But once more, we have to look more than 2,000 years later and see, well, what happened to that promise? Um, so not too long after this temple was built, just a couple hundred years later, uh, the evil Herod decorated the temple, adorned him, make it, made it look all pretty because he really liked getting the Jews on his side, even though he was an ungodly, evil person. He wanted to get them on his side, and so he tries to decorate the temple. A few years later, it's destroyed. And so now even this temple, it's gone. And so if we're thinking God's going to fill Haggai's temple with glory, I've got bad news for you. Apparently, God doesn't keep his promises. But we know, of course, that that's not what God's really talking about. In fact, we see all throughout the Old Testament, the earthly temple is never the final destination. The people of Haggai say they've already got the message from Ezekiel that God is going to build a final temple. We know looking at the whole Bible in Revelation, it talks about a new heavens and a new earth. It's these things that God is working towards, not the earthly things. The earthly things are a picture of the heavenly, the final things. And we also see, most comforting, that there will be peace in this place. Ironically, Solomon's name sounds a lot like peace in Hebrew, but of course Solomon didn't bring a lot of peace to the people. He brought a lot of foreign wives, he brought a lot of foreign gods. And so every king after Solomon almost is also caught up in all these false religions. Solomon didn't bring very much peace. This new temple didn't bring very much peace. It was violently destroyed, but God's going to bring new peace. And that's why the sil he says the silver and gold belong to me. God doesn't need these things. They're only a pale reflection of who God is, of how glorious God is. And they can't do anything to bring peace. But God can do something to bring peace. We know ultimately God secures our peace through the Prince of Peace, Jesus. And so we see all the way back in Haggai that God is working throughout redemptive history to bring his Messiah, to bring his people to himself, and to bring the world to its redemptive end. But in the meantime, while we wait, while the people in Haggai's day waited, there was work for them to do. But unfortunately, in Haggai's day, that work was corrupted in sin. Look with me now at verses 10 to 14, the present need for repentance. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of armies says. Ask the priest for a ruling. If a man is carrying consecrated meat and the fold of his garment, and it touches bread, stew, wine, oil, or any other food, does it become holy? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai asked, if someone defiled by contact with a corpse touches any of these, does it become defiled? The priest answered, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai replied, so is this people and so is this nation before me. This is the Lord's declaration. And so is every work of their hands, even what they offer there is defiled. So this next message of Haggai comes about two months after the previous message. Now, apparently the people had gone to work, but that still wasn't good enough. So Haggai's asking these questions, and we wonder, what does holy meat and corpses have to do with building a temple? What Haggai's doing is trying to expose to these people that they're saying they can't do anything about it, only the Lord can. And so he asked the priest for a ruling. Other translations say, what does the law say? 
um, but it's not law with a capital L. It's not God's law. What Haggai is asking on command of the Lord is what do your traditions say about cleanness and uncleanness, about holiness and unholiness? And so he asks, well, if somebody's carrying sacred meat in his cloak and it touches something else, does that also become holy? And they say, well, no. And then he asks, so if somebody touches a corpse, which is one of the easiest ways to be ritually uncleaned in ancient Israel, if someone touches a corpse and then touches something else, does that stuff become unclean? And the answer, of course, yes. Um, uncleanness was such a big deal. If you weren't unclean, you had to do everything you could to be clean before you interacted with anybody else. Now, these questions that Haggai's asking, first of all, he's asking the priest, what do your rules say about this? Their rules don't have much about this. They can't find anything in themselves, not even in God's law, of how do people within themselves make themselves right before God. They can't do it. But you know what they can do? They can have sin, and it can spread. And it spreads easy. That's what happens all throughout Israel's day. The king sins. He brings in wives who sin. Before you know it, everybody else is worshiping false gods. Uh, one church leader is caught up in sexual abuse. Before you know it, sometimes others are also involved in that, covering it up. We know, of course, our politicians, well, a lot of them are corrupt, so it's pretty easy for the new guy to do the same thing, right? Sin spreads easily. Holiness does not, because holiness can only come from the Lord. So Haggai tells them, just like this sin that you get spreads everywhere, or excuse me, just like the defilement from touching a corpse spreads everywhere, so this sin that you have spreads everywhere. And now everything you offer up to the Lord is defiled. It's not right. There's nothing you can do. You have to turn to the Lord to be made clean from this. The Israelites should have already known this. In fact, one of the first prophets is Isaiah. Isaiah 1 opens up with God going on this very long discourse about he, how he's not pleased with the rituals the Israelites are doing. He's not pleased with their sacrifices. He's not pleased with their prayers. He says, wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing what is evil. That's what God desires more than sacrifices. The great King David said the same thing when he sinned greatly against the Lord. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You were not pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. This is what the Israelites should have seen. The Lord gave his word. The Lord roused his people. And they began to work. And it looked on the outside like they were doing what they were supposed to. But they weren't. They had sin. They were going about this the wrong way, thinking that all they had to do was put their hand to the plow and God would be pleased. But that's not what God wants most of all. What God wants most of all is our inward affections, our inward devotions. And we can only get there by turning from sin. Now, we must work for the Lord. We must do the things he asks us to do. But it's not because we're doing these things to, to gain God's approval. Everything we do is defiled with sin until we turn to the Lord. And so the work we do for him must be done in response to this cleansing he's given us when we turn to him to be pardoned. And so Haggai's telling them, your sin is spread everywhere and you haven't done anything about it. And it's so, so severe in verse 14, if you'll go back and notice, Haggai replied, so this people and this nation before me, everything they offer is defiled. Now, a lot of times God calls Israel my people, right? He doesn't do it in this case. And in fact, it's pretty common in prophetic literature that God doesn't call Israel my people. He says this people, because when they're not devoted to the Lord, they're not his people. That's why Jeremiah in one of the first couple chapters, God says, I'm giving you a certificate of divorce. That's why Hosea names one of his children, not my people, because they weren't his people when they weren't following him. More than, more than doing some particular thing, more than being Jewish, more than living in the promised land, none of these things on their own could bring glory to God. They had to first be devoted to God. And so this is what God is pleading with them through Haggai to help them to see that they need to turn to him to be made clean. And so next we look at verses 15 to 19. We're calling this the past discipline and the present blessing. Now from this day on, think carefully. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, what state were you in? 
When someone came to a grain heap of 20 measures, it only amounted to 10. When one came to the wine press to dip 50 measures from the vat, it only amounted to 20. I struck you all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, but you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. From this day on, think carefully. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, think carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary? The vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yet produced. But from this day on, I will bless you. Now these verses remind us, of course, of what we've already went through in chapter 1. God sent a famine and drought to, see, to make the people see they needed to turn to him. Of course, in a culture where there's no food exporting, where it's very arid and hot, if you didn't have crops come in that year, you were ruined. And so this is what Haggai is describing. You go to get 10, uh, 20 measures, and it's only 10. You go to get 50, and it's only 20. They go, and they don't have enough. It's described in chapter 1, the, wa the wage earner puts wages into his pocket, but there's a hole in it. Every bit of money they have just goes right in and out. They eat, but they're never filled. It's economic devastation. The people are hungry. The crops they have haven't produced. There's no seeds left to plant. And the Lord takes credit for this. He's not hiding behind this. He doesn't say, well, golly, that's a, that's a bad rap, guys. No, he says, I did this. I struck all the work of your hands. And we obviously know from verse 14, the reason he struck the work of their hands is because of their sin, because they were defiled. And so even the crops they tried to make didn't produce. They had little food, what food they had sold for too much. Their land was devastated by blight, mildew, hail, all of which ruined their crops in various ways. The people had to know that even the food they ate was a blessing from him. And without his blessing, they would have nothing. I love the way the Puritan pastor Matthew Henry explained these verses. He said, while we take no care of God's interest, we cannot expect he should take care of ours. This is what happened. The people hadn't focused on the Lord. And so he let them suffer. They let the temple in ruins while they relaxed in their nice wooden houses on their lazy boy recliners. And so God sends them this disaster. But the good news was that God didn't leave his people under this discipline forever. He promises at the end of this passage that from this day on, he will bless them. Now what's happened here? Why all of a sudden would God have a change of heart? We know, of course, that God disciplines his people. But at the end of this passage, the discipline is stopped. Uh, Eugene Merrill is very helpful here. He says, the only explanation for this turn of events, for God turning from disciplining them to blessing them, is a turning back to God and repentance and renewal, a set of conditions not explicitly asserted in the text at this point. Thus, although we don't see in these verses that the people responded to God, clearly that's what happened given everything we already know in Haggai, given what we know about God's character and how he operates. It seems that the people had turned back to God, and so from this day on, he would bless them. They had the inward devotion to the Lord, and so outwardly what they did would be blessed by God. But it's not just these people as a whole. God also speaks to Zerubbabel. Turn with me uh, to verses 20 to 23, the future redemption. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will, will fall, each by his brother's sword. On that day, this is the declaration of the Lord of armies, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, this is the Lord's declaration, and make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. So now the word of the Lord comes to Haggai, but it doesn't come for the people as a whole. It comes specifically for their governor, Zerubbabel. But Why? Zerubbabel, if you'll remember, was the governor when the people got released from exile and started building their temple. Or at least he was there. He's not mentioned explicitly as the governor. But Zerubbabel is with the people when they start building the temple. And he's with them for 20 years while they're not building the temple. The word of the Lord comes to this guy. 
and says, you're going to be my signet ring, you're my servant, what's going on here? If you're going to pick anybody who outwardly looks like a good instrument for God to use, it's not Zerubbabel. He's the failed governor of a financially crippled, religious, religiously lazy, and tiny state. He's also the grandson of the very evil and God-rejected king of Judah, Jehoiakim. He's not even a king. He's a governor. He's ruling only with the king's permission. And by the way, given his bloodline, this is not the guy you want to rule. Why would God choose this man for anything? Well, we know, first of all, God can use whoever he wants. He talks a lot about using Nebuchadnezzar, who maybe to the end of his life was a very prideful, arrogant, lost man. But God would use the king of Babylon. And so God could use Zerubbabel in spite of his stubbornness, in spite of his sinfulness, But it seems like since from this day on, God's going to bless them, that Zerubbabel, like the rest of the people, had seen outward works is not enough. I need inward devotion to the Lord. I need to repent of my sins and turn my life over to him. And so Zerubbabel's done this, and this is when God says, I'm going to use you. Jehoiakim, God told him, was rejected by God, and none of his descendants would sit on David's throne. Now Zerubbabel's promising, you'll be like my signet ring, my servant. It's not because Zerubbabel's that special, although certainly he did turn to the Lord when he was supposed to. It's because God is special. God's the one who will choose him and use him. And so God tells Zerubbabel, first of all, the message we already heard, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. Again, that God's going to take and loosen everything out of the earth that shouldn't be there because God's in control. We also see he'll overturn royal thrones. He'll destroy the Gentile kingdoms. He'll overturn chariots and their riders. They'll even die to each other, to their brothers. God is not just going to turn up the heavens of the earth. Specifically, he's going to turn up the evil powers of the heavens and the earth and the evil peoples of the heavens and the earth. God can do this, of course, because as Haggai consistently records, the Lord who is speaking is the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. God also tells Zerubbabel he'll be his servant. Now, in Hebrew, this is a term that's used specifically for David. David is called the servant of God. And so we have even here undertones of this future Davidic king, this future Davidic savior who's going to come and once and for all set his people free, set on a throne that will never end. And so we see all the way back in God's promise to David in 2 Samuel 7. He says, the Lord himself will make a house for you when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors. I'll raise up after you your descendants who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, at first glance, this could sound like Zerubbabel, right? He's a descendant of David. He's going to be building a house for the Lord, but the throne of his kingdom doesn't last forever. In fact, just a few hundred years after this, Israel is crushed under the boot of Rome. And so it wasn't some earthly kingdom that God is talking about. No, it's Jesus' kingdom. If you look in the genealogies of Jesus at the beginning of the Gospels, you know who's there. Zerubbabel. He was a faithful man, and God said, I'm going to use you. And so it's not the physical Zerubbabel God's about. It's not any physical man. One of my favorite parts of the New Testament is um, I think it's Peter, might be Stephen, but it's one of those sermons and acts that's going through the whole of the Old Testament for the Jews. And so he mentions all these great people, and then they died and they rested with their fathers, right? So David did all these great things, and David died. And so in this sermon, we see this hopelessness. Every person who we thought was some great final leader died, and he was buried with his ancestors. And then he, comes to Peter, um, then he comes to Jesus, and he stops, right? Because Jesus' kingdom is established forever. Jesus died. Yes, he did. But guess what? He rose again. And so it's not Zerubbabel that is this eternal Savior. It's not Zerubbabel who's going to be the signet ring. A signet ring was a symbol of a king's authority. The king would use this to stamp official seals. The king of Babylon, or excuse me, the king of Medo-Persia in Daniel 6, he puts the seal on the stone that he rolls over the lion's den. So everybody walks by and knows this is here by the king's authority. Well, Jesus comes, and he is the mark of the Lord's authority. And so looking over these last verses of Haggai, looking at the book as a whole, 
we have this good news for you, for us. Whatever is going on, however chaotic things seem, however much we get caught in our sin, if we turn to the Lord, he is on our side. God will shake the heavens and the earth. God will defeat his enemies. God will protect his people. God will send his Messiah, Jesus. We don't have to sit and wonder, does the Lord remember us? Does the Lord still care for us in our sins? No, we simply have to turn to the Lord and know that he is working things out in his time. Once more, once and for all, in a little while, very soon in the Lord's timing. And so in the meantime, we have this application for all of us. First of all, we must trust in the Lord. We must trust in his character. We must trust who God is. So God tells the people through Haggai, this is the promise I made to you when I, came, when I brought you out of Egypt. God's character means that he doesn't break a promise. He's perfect. He doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. If he said he's going to love and protect his people to the end, you know what he's going to do? Exactly that. And we can see that by his past actions again and again in the Old Testament and the New, God is delivering his people from their sin and from their enemies. We can trust in God's plan that he will shake the heavens and the earth, that he will bring us to this new temple, to this new heavens and earth. And finally, we can trust in his love for all of his people. If you turn to the Lord, I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. And so when we trust in the Lord, we can also work for the Lord. Of course, we can't trust in the Lord until we trust him most of all with our sins. And so this is the sequence. We turn to the Lord for our forgiveness from our sins. We trust that he knows what he's doing, that he's somebody we can turn to. And then we can work for him. This is the message of Haggai. Work for I am with you. Turn to the Lord for your sin. Trust him. Trust his character. And trust that as you are working, he is with you. Now we ask the question, what is this work? Like I said last week, if all Haggai was about was God needs a nice building to worship in, we're done. We can go home. I could have been eating lunch an hour ago. But that's not what Haggai's about. Instead, what Haggai is about is that God has work for each of his people that we must pursue with worship, with right intentions. And so for us in this church, the work we have to the Lord, first of all, is to be here, to be committed. Like I said last week, the author of Hebrews says, don't neglect gathering together. Gather together and encourage each other. This world is crazy. This life is hard. We need each other. I can say, especially this church, we have a lot of sickness. We have a lot of loss. We have a lot of challenges facing us. We need each other. And so work, first of all, by being here, by being committed, by lifting each other up. Work in the labor of prayer. There's a lot of answered prayers we have in this congregation. I'll say for one, I certainly am an answered prayer. There were many years where I didn't want to pursue ministry, and now here I am. I'm only here because people prayed for me, and the Lord honored that prayer. Brother Sanford's here because we've been praying that he'd be able to get around better, and here he is this morning. That doesn't mean that God will answer every prayer, but it does mean that we can bring these burdens to the Lord, and he tells us to. Finally, we can work for the Lord by simply asking, where are the people in our lives that we can minister to? Do we have lost people around us? Do we have kids, grandkids, neighbors, friends who don't know the Lord? That is your work. Work for the Lord is with you. But in the midst of this work, we can rest in the Lord. One of my favorite passages, it's right here, John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. Be courageous. I have overcome the world. This is what Jesus tells his disciples. It's one of their last moments together. Take heart, some translations say. I have overcome the world. We don't have to worry about every challenge in our path being bulldozed over by us. It's not in us to do it. It's in our Lord to do it. And even though David died, even though Zerubbabel died, even though all of us too will face death, the work of the cross is already finished. Simply turn to the Lord, trust in the Lord, and know that while you are here on this earth, there is fruitful labor for you. Go, pursue it. God will be with you in that work. And when he's done with you, he will bring you home. And that's all we've got to worry about. That's the good news of Haggai. Turn to the Lord. He is working things out. And now as we end, um, first of all, I'll say um, our invitation hymn is going to be in Christ alone. Now, normally we do hymns that are something about turn from your sins to Jesus. 
But Haggai doesn't end on that message. Haggai ends on victory. Haggai ends saying, Jesus is coming. This is the Lord's declaration. And so for each of us, just take a few moments before the song to reflect, can I say in Christ alone? And if you can, sing it loudly, sing it boldly, sing it with joy, because in Christ alone, my hope is found. I hope in Christ alone, your hope is found. And so Miss Jenny will come up in a moment and play through the first verse. We'll have some time to pray. And now let us end um, with a prayer from the great reformer John Calvin on this passage, if you'll bow with me. Grant, almighty God, that as much as we come from our mother's womb, holy and pure and polluted, and afterwards continually contract so many new defilements, O oh, grant that we may flee to the fountain which alone can cleanse us. And as there is no other way by which we can be cleansed from the defilements of the flesh, except that we are sprinkled by the blood of your only begotten Son, and that by the hidden power of your Spirit, and thus renounce all our vices, O oh, grant that we may strive so truly and sincerely to devote ourselves to you, daily to renounce more and more of our evil affections, and to have nothing else as the object, but to submit our minds and all our affections to you by denying ourselves and to exercise ourselves in this strenuous effort as long as we are in this world until we attain to that true and perfect purity which is laid up for us in your only begotten Son when we shall be fully united to him, having been transformed into that glory into which he has been received. Amen. <laughs>